Night Chill Audio Books presents Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, written in 1994 by John Barrett, read by James Ross Spencer. Chapter 13 Checks and Balances. Sometimes I think you Yankees only come down here to stir up trouble, said Joe Odom. I mean, look at Jim Williams, a model citizen, minds his own business, one success after another. Then you come along, and the next thing we know he's killed somebody? I mean, really. It was three in the morning. Joe was moving out of the house on Liberty Street exactly six months after having moved in. The unsuspecting real estate agent Simon Stokes was due back from England the next day, and Joe intended to restore the house to the condition in which Mr. Stokes had left it, locked and empty. Joe had found another house to move into on Lafayette Square, and now in the dead of night he dumped a last armload of clothes into the van parked out front. All right, he said, so now we have a murder in a big mansion. God damn. Well, let's see where that puts us. We've got a weirdo bug specialist slinking around town with a bottle of deadly poison. We've got a nigger drag queen, an old man who walks an imaginary dog, and now a faggot murder case. My friend, you are getting me and Mandy into one hell of a movie. Joe went back inside to search for telltale signs that he had been living there for six months. In the past half year, the supposedly unoccupied house had played host to a maelstrom of humanity. Over a thousand tourists had trapped, traped through, peering into every nook and cranny, and pausing to have a buffet lunch before leaving. At the same time, the never-ending parade of Joe's friends flowed in and out, with Jerry, the hairdresser, operating an all but full-time beauty salon in the kitchen. These diverse activities merged and mingle, sometimes with comical results. More than a few elderly ladies who came to the house for lunch got completely restyled, and nearly everyone emerged clutching handbills advertising sweet George Browns. As always, new faces joined the cast of characters in Joe's entourage. Some hung on for a week or a month, others longer. As adroit as he was at gathering a crowd around him, Joy was utterly unable to cast anyone out. That task fell to an inner circle of friends who took it upon themselves to weed out unsavory hanger-ons with or without Joe's knowledge. In recent months, the primary target of this group had been a well-dressed man who arrived in Savannah purporting to be a Palm Beach millionaire. In actual fact, he was a small-time entrepreneur who had opened a hall house on the road to Taibe. Before anyone knew it, he was quietly soliciting business from the men in the tour groups at Joe's. The inner circle called on a retired policeman, Sarge Bolton, to get rid of him. One glimpse of the revolver in Sarge's shoulder holster, and the man was gone. Joe's friends had nothing against whorehouses, but they were worried that this one might complicate matters for Joe, who was just now coming under the scrutiny of the authorities because of the bad checks he had written before the opening of Sweet George Browns. The checks had begun to arrive at the prosecutor's office on the average of one a week. The carpenter's check, the electrician's check, the plumber's check, the check for the antique merry-go-round horse on top of the bar. When the total reached 18,000, two sheriff deputies came to Sweet Georgia Browns and served Joe with a summons. He was directed to appear for a hearing in court. Depending on the outcome of the hearing, he might or might not be indicated for writing worthless checks, a felony punishable by one to five years in prison. On the day of the hearing, Joe strolled calmly into the courtroom 20 minutes late. Before taking his seat, he ampled over to the bench where the plaintiffs were sitting and greeting each of them. 
Howdy, George, he said to the carpenter. The carpenter managed a wan smile. Hey, Joe, he said. Joe moved on to the electrician, the plumber, the general contractor, the man from the linen supply, and on down the line. Howdy. Afternoon. Hello. He spoke without a hint of sarcasm or irony. His voice was cheerful. His eyes were bright. His smile broad and easy. It was almost as if he were greeting patrons at Sweet George Brown's. Joe's affability contrasted with the discomfiture of the men on the bench. Their embarrassed, almost sheepish expressions made them seem more like the accused than the aggrieved, as if by being there they had been caught in an act of disloyalty against their genial friend. They smiled meekly and mumbled hellos. At the end of the row, Joe came to a tiny, sparrow like man with silver hair and bushy black eyebrows. It was an antique dealer from Charleston who had sold him the merry-go-round horse and other pieces of furniture. Joe brightened. Why, Mr. Russell, he said, what a surprise. I didn't know you were coming. Mr. Russell shifted nervously in his seat. Believe me, Joe, I would rather not have come. I really hate this, but you know, uh, I, uh... Oh, that's all right, said Joe. I can't say I blame you. It's just that if I'd known you were coming, I'd have asked you to bring that pair of sconces I like so much. Oh, did you, the man said. I mean, did I, I, I mean, did we, uh... Mr. Russell blinked as if trying to clear his head. Oh, now I remember, he said. We did talk about those sconces, didn't we? You're right. I've forgotten all about them. Well, uh, now that you mention it, Joe, I guess I could have brought them with me. Well, don't worry about it, said Joe. We can discuss it later. He walked over and took a seat alone at the defense table. The hearing judge gaveled the room to order. Mr. Odom, are you being represented by counsel? Your Honor, said Joe, as a member in good standing of the State Bar of Georgia, I'll be representing myself. The judge nodded. Well then, let's proceed. An assistant prosecutor read off the list of Joe's bad checks. Then one by one, the plaintiffs took the stand and described the work they had done or the goods they had supplied and how no matter how often they tried to cash Joe's checks, they always bounced. When Mr. Russell took the stand, the prosecutor and the judge conferred at the bench for several minutes, riffling through papers. The judge then wrapped his gavel and informed Mr. Russell that in filing his complaint, he had not followed the proper procedure. Therefore, his claim would be disallowed, at least for the time being. This would reduce the bad checks charged against Joe by the sum of $4,200. A red-faced Mr. Russell came down from the stand and took his seat. Your Honor, said Joe, with your permission, I'd like to have a word with Mr. Russell. No objection, the judge replied. Joe motioned for the antique dealer to come over and sit next to him. He took the man's file and spread the papers on the table. Then, while the courtroom looked on, Joe read through the papers, speaking to Mr. Russell in a quiet, confidential tone. After a few minutes, he looked up at the judge. Your Honor, he said, if you will allow me, I think we can remedy the situation in 20 minutes or so. And once we've done that, you can reinstate Mr. Russell's claim against me. The judge looked warily at Joe, uncertain whether he was merely having a laugh at the court's expense or whether he might actually be slipping a fast one by him. The court appreciates your offer, the judge said, but I doubt there's any precedent for a defendant acting as counsel for the plaintiff. One can worry that counsel might place his own best interest ahead of those of his client, if you see my point. I do, your honor, said Joe, but in this case, it really is just a matter of filing out or filling out forms. This gentleman has come all the way from Charleston to claim money that's rightfully his, and it doesn't seem fair to turn him away just yet because he messed up on some minor clerical procedure. True, said the judge. Well, well, all right, go on. Go ahead. 
One more thing, Your Honor, said Joe. I would like to add for the record that I am doing this on a pro bono basis. Well, good for you, said the judge, foregoing my normal legal fees of $4,200. In the laughter that followed, Joe returned toward Mandy and me and winked. The hearing went into recess while Joe rewrote Mr. Russell's claim against him. When he was finished, Mr. Russell sells... 4200 was added back onto the total, and Joe took the stand. He told the court that he had written the checks in the expectation that the developers of City Market, where Sweet Georgia Brands was located, would come through with several thousand dollars they owed him, but they had not. Therefore, the checks were unintentional overdrafts. The judge and the prosecutors appealed to appeared to doubt Joe's exclamation and explanation, but they agreed to drop the charges if he made good on the entire eight ten thousand in one month's time. Failing that, he would almost certainly be indicted. The judge, the prosecutor, and the plaintiffs all expressed the hope that Joe would settle the matter before it came to that, and he did. But it was not through the cash flow of Sweet Georgia Browns. Joe was saved this time by a loan of eighteen thousand from a rich young couple who had recently moved to Savannah and who had fallen under the spell of Joe Odom and Sweet Georgia Browns. Joe's good luck extended to the matter of finding new quarters to live in before Simon Stokes returned. At the last moment, he had arranged to occupy the spacious and elegant parlor floor of the Hamilton Turner House a few blocks away on Lafayette Square. The landlord was an old friend who lived in Natchez and knew all about Joe's bus tours and the tourist lunches and Joe's entourage and Jerry the hairdresser. All of that was fine with him. Joe finished his sweep of the Liberty Street house, removing the last traces of his occupancy. Then he came back outside to sit on the front steps and have a cigarette. He had to admit things were not so bad after all. His bad checks had been made good. He was about to move into a beautiful old mansion. The prosecutor was off his back. And there was nothing for him to do now but smoke his cigarette and wait for Mandy to do one final load of laundry. When she was finished, he would disconnect the electricity and the telephone, turn off the water, lock the front door, and move on. It was daybreak when Joe went to bed in his new house. He slept until early evening. Then he rose and went to Sweet Georgia Browns, where the first person through the door was Mr. Russell, the antique dealer from Charleston. He was carrying the sconces, ornate brass fixtures with tall hurricane lamps. Joe put them up on either side of the big mirror over the bar and lit the candles. The lights danced and flickered. Will you take a check for them, he asked. Why, certainly, said Mr. Russell. I'd be much obliged, said Joe, if first of the month. You hold it till then. Oh, I'd be happy to, Mr. Russell said. Joe turned to go back to the piano and found himself looking into the grinning face of the real estate agent, Simon Stokes. I'm back, Mr. Stokes proclaimed. If you still want that house on Liberty Street, you can have it. I saved it for you the whole time I was gone. Oh, I know you did, said Joe, and I appreciate it more than I can say.